Okie dokie, everybody. Uh, hope you had a nice snack and are refreshed and rejuvenated. And we're going to start our third uh, panel, which is on implementation practice conversation. Um, we're honored to have the Honorable Judge Stephen uh, Z. Mostofsky coming from New York. He's acting Justice Supreme Court, Kings County, mental hygiene part. Uh, Dr. Scott. Uh, uh, Zeller, um, who's Vice President of Acute Psychiatric Medicine of Vituity. Brian Bixler, Lieutenant Two of Crisis Support Section, LAPD. And Carla Farias, um, Bonus One Field Training Officer of LA County Sheriff's Department. So police, psychiatrist, police sheriff, psychiatrists, and judges are kind of the key, quote, official players in the context of civil commitment. The professionals who interact with patients and get them care. What is their perspective on what is right and what is wrong in the current system? What are their thoughts on how to design a better system of civil commitment? Do they envision greater cooperation among these, uh, these key players and how could that be affected? So uh, thank you for being here. And I guess you know the first question I have, um, I'd like to ask uh, the police officers um, to describe a kind of average mental health call and how do you respond and should you best respond? Well, a uh, call, can you guys all hear me? I'm sorry. A call is generated and ultimately, uh, in my case, I'm a field training officer, so I usually have the new uh, deputies that come out in the field and come with me. and. Uh, whether we have history with the house or whether something else that was uh, brought up that the caller said to the um, call taker is something we take into consideration. Um, when we respond to a house, uh, we always want to know if this person does exhibit some form of uh, mental health, meaning, you know, we ask the callers usually, does he have a diagnosis, what is he doing, where he's at, you know, certain questions like that just so that we can have an understanding as to what we're going to. Um, at times, as you may know, you may know your loved one, but unfortunately, we don't. And with mental health, sometimes calling the police is the bad thing. You know, they just have uniform, this uniform itself, there's been bad experiences. Whether the person is nonverbal or is high functioning or low functioning, they just say that means we're going to the hospital. So it is very, very hard um, at times to just kind of put everything together. At times when we do go to calls, we try to take all the information necessary by asking all the questions. But at times, you know, we don't get it all. Um, if the person... So if you know it's a mental health call, do you sometimes bring a social worker or a psychologist with you, or you don't have that ability? Our policy um, does not, we do not have a social worker there. We do uh, ask for a SAM 918, which is our mental health unit, our MET team, to start responding at the time. They add, we, we notify them once we arrive to the location, we start advising them as to what we have, and then they make the determination if they are available, because sometimes they're not, if they're going to be taken to a hospital. Thank you. Um, what is, you know, what is the kind of typical approach? I mean, I think, is it a show of force? Does that calm people down? Or do you try to be very calm and soothing? Or, and do you have training on how to deal with these situations? It's a great question. Um, when the LAPD, we actually put every one of our officers through 40 hours of mental health intervention training. Um, that training now comes at month 11 of their field training. So when they're brand new police officers, they have a year long field training period. At month 11, they come back as a class and they go through our 40 hour class. Um, that class will include people like Harold who comes in and speaks. I can't see him now. There he is over there. Thank you so much. Comes in and talks to our officers about what it's like. Um, we have consumers come in and they get to interact. So. Um, we do teach that, but a lot of times police officers are going into a call, they've gotten the call 30 seconds ago of, of you know, the call may come out, this is how it's coded, violent male with mental illness running in through traffic in the middle of the street holding a stick. Uh -huh. So, or just a, you know, a 415 man running in the middle of the street. They don't know whether the person is drunk, mentally ill, high. They don't know, but we all go based on behavior. What are the behaviors we're seeing before us and how can we best mitigate that? And so we talk about observing. What is it you're seeing? If you say, stop, turn around, put your hands up, and you get that, that blank stare, or their, their eyes go up and to the right, and they're reacting to internal stimuli, then it's okay, let's take a step back. This person is not just saying, I don't like you because you're a cop. They're reacting to internal stimuli, so we have to slow things down. So we talk about that. Slow it down. 
Um, take away, if there's sirens on, because we tend to leave sirens on, just, you know, it's just what we do. Turn off sirens, turn off lights, have one person talk. So there's lots of things we do teach officers. Um, and in the height of the moment, sometimes officers will forget those things. But we try to ingrain that in the training we're doing now. And I know that, uh, you know, across the country, having 40 hours of mental health training, um, they usually just give it to people who volunteer. It's called CIT, um, which is a great program. Although most of it, and the national standard, is that only those who volunteer go to that class. We're like, no, we don't want to people to have to gamble on who's going to show up to their house or right. on that radio call. So we train every single one of our officers in that 40-hour school. Right. Right. Um, so uh, what percentage of your cases involve mental health? And what do you think happens when show, use of force goes bad? Is there, you, I'm sure you afterwards talk a lot about it and think about how you could have done it differently. Is, are there any, you know, kind of characteristics of, of that? Um, for us, we, um, it's a mandatory box on all the use of forces. Any use of force that happens, we have to ask that question. Was this influenced by mental illness? Check that box. And that comes with it now, uh, a higher level of scrutiny and review of, okay, well, um, Sometimes it, it may not have made a difference whether the person was drunk, mentally ill. It was a it was a violent encounter already, and we had to do something there. So, um, but we do look at, and I get notified of every mental health um, or mental illness related use of force, and we look at them and to try and determine is there is there some characteristics that are the same or different, and um, it's it's hard to come to any uh, you know, finding of what what is the same, what is different, because it's all behavior related. On those things, so I don't know if that answered your okay, question. Good, good. Um, so, uh, Steve, um, what's it like to hear commitment cases? Is it is it stressful? Is it gratifying? What what does your typical case look like? Well, just so you understand, we have to send in quarterly reports and we get statistics. So March thirty first is the end of. Well, the first quarter. I did 425 hearings between January and the end of March. So I do hearings on initial commitments where somebody will bring someone in on a warrant. And we have a very quick, they, they apply for one and we have listened to what they say. And I have to make a decision on whether or not I should issue a full warrant where they will bring the person in handcuffs. And if necessary, they will send them for a 72-hour evaluation. So I hear those hearings, and I hear them when they come back. Then there are a number of places along the way where the patient can come and make an application to the court for release based on the fact that they are no longer uh, dangerous to themselves or others, and will hold a hearing. And then there'll be another case a point on another point of time where the hospital could come in and also ask for a six-month uh, uh, hospital stay based on the fact that the person is dangerous to themselves and others, and nothing has worked. Uh, so the cases are stressful. Uh, they move very quickly. Uh, we are very lucky that the uh, court system, our appellate system, has set up mental hygiene legal services. They represent every single patient the second they are put into the system. And they're very, very good at it. And they will argue whatever they can argue without going too far. Uh, and we have the same lawyers that are there representing the hospitals. And, you know, sometimes we have patients that we have to excuse. Uh, we actually had somebody on the witness stand and they started talking out loud and the doctor turned around to me and said, quickly remove them from the courtroom. That's never happened before. They're going to turn extremely violent. And we took the person outside, and that's exactly what happened. So it is stressful, uh, but the one thing I try to do is take in consideration. I had no training when I got put in this part. My training was basically Ellen's book, and the book <laughs> that they mentioned crazy. I asked, one, I asked one of the doctors, I said, I don't know anything about this. Can, can you suggest a few books for me? Uh, some uh, other books, Ellen's book on competency. And I, I've learned along the way by speaking to a lot of doctors. Uh, and I question the doctors, and I don't let them just bulldoze me. They'll ask for anxiety. I, we have mental 
we have medicine over objection. So many times the doctors will suggest certain medications. And the patient might say, I took Haldol. It made me feel absolutely terrible, and I'll go through every one of the uh, side effects that Haldol has. And I will turn around and tell the doctor, you know, the patient might be in the hospital, but they're definitely co competent to explain how miserable a medication was for them, and I will strike that medication. Or they'll say that they need anxiety medication, and nowhere in the doctor's testimony did they say they had anxiety. So these cases move very, very quickly. I hear three days a week, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. On Wednesdays, we hear applications for uh, assisted outpatient treatment as well. So we go through the week, uh, you know, and just very quickly, these patients go from serious cases where, where you have to get through them. And uh, one of the more interesting cases, we're in the middle of the case, a gentleman just held up a pair of jockey shorts. Nobody knew why. His lawyer was in the middle of arguing the case, jumped about four feet, took a look, sat down and go, Your Honor, I rest. And that was the end of the case. So we see everything along the gamut from people who are really seriously ill. We have people that had two uh, MIT uh, degrees in electrical engineering and a woman who was getting out of the hospital with uh, two uh, PhDs, two pensions, and Social Security. And when they were talking to her about housing, she turned around and said, I could afford housing better than you can. I have a place to go. So we, we hear all of these cases, and it's different. The biggest problem we have, which was brought up before, is HIPAA. Most of these people do not want their family involved whatsoever. And, we, and the hospitals turn around and say, we can listen to what the family says. We can't involve them. We can't talk to them. We can't do anything. And the other one that is, if the person does have a psychiatrist, unfortunately, the psychiatrists don't call back to hospital many times. But this is what I hear every day, and I try to take each case uh, as it is, and you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. There's different diagnoses. I ask the doctors, why is this a diagnosis? Why is that a diagnosis? And uh, sometimes I uh, let the person out, even though the per they don't agree. They told me somebody had, uh, was paranoid because there were germs in the hospital. I looked at the doctor, I said, have you ever heard how you describe the way some people come into this hospital? If I was here, I'd also want to get out of the hospital because there were germs. And I released the person from the hospital because I felt that that was absolutely one of the most normal things that somebody has argued. They don't want to be in a hospital because there are germs. So it, it runs across the gamut. And, and, you know, again, it's stressful. But uh, I come home at the end of the day very satisfied. I try to work with the patients. I try to do what I can to, to get them the... Uh, uh, needs, some patients complain they don't go outside. I try to get them to go outside. And uh, it's, it's just very, very interesting. And I find that uh, most of my colleagues think I'm, maybe I should be put somewhere. But I find it <laughs> very, very gratifying at the end of the day what I do. I really, really do. Great, great. Um, so uh, another question I have is, uh, what you all, well, let me ask Scott, what, what are the kind of challenges and gratifications and describe what you do. You've got this whole network. Describe your program and what you do in it and how, how you know, <clears throat> how you feel about it. Oh, thank you. Um, so maybe let me preface a little bit. I've been involved working in emergency psychiatry for over 30 years now. I used to be president of the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry, I've written several textbooks on the topics most recently about the best practices and the evaluation and treatment of agitation. Hearing some of the stories from the consumers in the room frustrate me because it's things that uh, my colleagues and I have been working against uh, for many years now, uh, hearing even like the judges' tales of haloperidol, Haldol, um, which we've been trying to discourage people from using unless it's really necessary. There was a, uh, a, a, an important uh, review organization called the Cochrane Database that actually came out two years ago and said, haloperidol should not be used in emergency situations if you have an alternative. And yet people still are using it right and left. I had a doctor that I tried to convince to stop using haloperidol with patients because people, like you said, the patients hate it. 
it makes them feel awful. We have better alternatives that are more benign and, and, and are more helpful. And, and a doctor said to me, why would I stop using it? It's always worked great for me. <laughs> like, Gee, I didn't realize you were shooting yourself with this stuff. You know? uh, but I think one of the things that also has been resonating and hearing from folks is that the involuntary, um, you know, there, there's two different terms here that I think we've been uh, kind of conflating today. And, and one is detention and another is commitment. And detention is when the officers or, or the deputies are actually bringing somebody in from the field and have a justification to bring somebody to a hospital. And then commitment would be that longer term, you're going to be staying in the hospital, you're going in front of a judge. Um, I think that both processes have historically left a lot to be desired. Uh, and where I work in the emergency department, we've really been trying to fix what has historically been a very coercive and unpleasant situation for people. Um, and one of the things that we found that's been most disturbing is, especially when somebody goes to a regular emergency department, is they will be you know, brought in against their will and no one will explain anything to them what's going on. No one will listen to their concerns. Everybody's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, they're restrained in leather restraints and injected with painful medications until they're unconscious. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do, and we've established a model that we have fortunately uh, been able to get uh, started in, in multiple locations around the country already, and uh, our, our newest one is opening in Billings, Montana tomorrow, I'm excited to say that, uh, is called the Empath Unit, which are actually hospital-based emergency psychiatry programs on site next to regular ERs. And Empath stands for Emergency Psychiatric Assessment, Treatment, and Healing Unit. So instead of being sit down and shut up, we're going to send you to a psych hospital, it's instead warm greeting and understanding, lots of listening, putting somebody in a more comfortable environment, not making decisions on where you're going to go or whether you're going to need to continue to be detained until we've had a chance to work with you, try to engage you, and see how you do for a few hours. We've got up to 24 hours to work with you. Instead of being restrained to a gurney, we have a room where everybody's got their own recliner, which can fold flat if you want to take a nap or if you want to sit up and engage in peer uh, support or, or group therapy, we can do things like that. All the time, nurses, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, psychologists, working with you to see how you do. And above all, I, like I said, the most important thing, listening, making sure that you're comfortable, your needs are met, and then we'll see how you do. And not trying to make a decision when you're at your worst, when two police officers are holding you and you don't know why you're there. And Instead, it's all about explaining and engaging. One of the things we think is most important in that process, we've been talking about detention and commitment, is we'd like to change you from an involuntary patient into a voluntary patient in an empath unit. There's no reason you can't get the same level of care voluntarily as you can involuntarily. Maybe if we do a good job and we seem like good people and are able to explain what's going on to you and able to listen to what you have to say, that maybe you'll say, hey, you know, maybe this isn't a bad thing. Maybe I'll work together with you guys and we'll figure out a way to go forward from here instead of saying, no, you have to do what we say, you're, you're on a 5150. What a difference that is. And once we are engaging and connecting, then we don't have to be so concerned about all these involuntary processes and commitments and things like that. Every time we get engagement, that just saves the, the, the whole legal system a lot of troubles and it means that we're actually going to work together with you to make things better. And if we I see you. If I get sick again, can I call you? <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. I, I was hoping that when, uh, when somebody said it earlier today that there's no good psychiatrist, I hope that at least I'd seem like it was not so bad. So, anyway. Thank you. Um, what do people think about what the ideal standard for involuntary commitment should be? Do you like what we have? Would you like a you know, seriously mentally ill in need of treatment, in need of hospital treatment, maybe add on, don't appreciate you need it? I mean, what do people think about what the best, best rubric would or should be? If I may, if I can answer this one. Um, it's frustration from law enforcement, at least where I work. We have 
high functioning individuals and we have low functioning individuals. Low functioning individuals, unfortunately, using this as an example, autism, some low functioning Down syndrome, some behaviorally challenged nonverbal individuals. Mm -hmm. um, those are very hard for us to do. Unfortunately, there's no places. Uh, this place that uh, he was explaining, it sounds amazing. But when you come across someone that doesn't have, or can't tell you what's wrong, what's going on, I need help, I need this, where do we put them? In my personal opinion, I wish we had change in that. Um, background on me, I have a low functioning autistic child, severe behavior. They wanted me to institutionalize him at the age of four. Um, he's four, he's, like, he's this big. And you know, I take this very personal. I have a, a brother that has Down syndrome. I have another brother who has ADHD and is also behaviorally challenged. Um, you know, it, it gets very frustrating because the only way we, at least for myself, I'm able to help them is because of the experiences I've gone through. You turn it around and you have my partners who go over there, they're calling me because they don't know what to do. Um, and it's not because of the lack of knowledge. The Sheriff Department also does 40 hours of intervention of the crisis intervention training. But if you guys can tell me what autistic child does the same thing, what Down syndrome child does the same thing, schizophrenia, bipolar, you know, you come across certain people and everybody has their thing. Everybody does one thing. Everybody, you know, you won't find someone who does the same thing, similar, but not the same. Um, if I could change anything, I would, all, I would go towards the hospitals. Our hospitals has been one of our biggest issues and it was something we discussed. And that's not all of them, um, primarily the ones that are not um, LPSs, which is who takes these, these um, adults and children, because we go in there with the hold and within an hour, if we're lucky, they're released. Unfortunately, all we simply do, there's been a misunderstanding on the 72 hour hold, that is simply an application. So what we do is we go, here you go, they're exhibiting all of this. And there's been times where we've had to go back and using as an example, I had a 19 year old autistic, severe, nonverbal, big guy, 6'2", minimum 250. He liked to go for the face. His mom was five foot, maybe 100 pounds. We took him to the hospital, 5150 them. Hospital tells him, we're not a psychiatric facility. You guys need to go on your way. You guys need to go home. We cannot help you. You know, can you imagine someone saying that about your child? I mean, that broke my heart. She called me. She or says, saying it about a child who has cancer. Or absolutely. Like they are yeah. not any different. Mm -hmm. You know, this is their baby, and that's the conversation I have with the hospital. We went back. She went home. Same thing. Now she has a blue eye. She has a black and blue face, right? Mm -hmm. Because what did he do? He went for the face. 5150 again, me and my supervisors obviously did what we had to do, but towards the end, he was in the hospital for 30, excuse me, for 60 days before they found placement for him in a home. And their biggest issue was, we don't know where to put him, he's extremely violent, and he does, we don't know what to do with him. So I'm here for the ones that don't know how to speak, obviously all of them, but this is also a population that unfortunately, nowadays, we don't know what to do with. What about, that's, thank you. And that, I knew that was one of the questions we were going to be uh, dealing with today. And I went through the uh, definition about imminent risk of uh, harm to uh, self or others. And uh, I looked up every uh, definition uh, through those uh, standards. And I came away with the uh, feeling that the imminent risk of harm of serious, and, and New York it gives specific, uh, let's say uh, harm to self would be attempted suicide, uh, and harm to others would be a threat or actual assault. And I went through them, and I tried to think of what I would replace it with. And for a court system and a hospital to use an, another standard, because again, one of the things that we start as soon as a patient comes to the hospital is to prepare for discharge. And to prepare for discharge it to, and send somebody out there just so that they could come back to the hospital a week and a half later is not really going to do anything. So they really need to be safe when they come out of the hospital. And I really gave this, I probably gave this the most thought of anything preparing for this today's session. But I did, I did want to just note, and I, the only thing I brought up here was the Supreme Court in Addington versus Texas, which is a case where Texas had beyond a reasonable doubt as the standard for a psychiatric admission. 
and that's the, uh, that's the standard for uh, criminal cases. And it was interesting that the court said psychiatric diagnosis in, con in contrast is to a large extent based on medical impressions drawn from subjective analysis and filtered through the experience of the diagnostician. This often makes it very difficult for the expert physician to, often def to offer def definite conclusions about any particular patient. And they're talking that with, uh, as far as, as, far as a, uh, saying beyond the reasonable doubt, because how is the doctor going to say that I know this decision beyond the reasonable doubt? Clear and convincing is something lower than that. It means that, that it's, it should be. Uh, we believe it to be. It's less than a preponderance, which is uh, the lowest standard used in most cases, civil cases, which is uh, it could be 50 point any percent on one side and they win. And uh, the only thing that always bothers me is that if you have a moving violation in New York and you go before a hearing judge, the standard is also clear and convincing. Now, if you believe it, clear and convincing in a psychiatric hospitalization and clear and convincing in a moving violation before an administrative hearing officer where you never win is a much different standard of clear and convincing, but nevertheless, that's the standard. And, and I think New York standard is really the only thing that, that you could work with, at least in, in our state. Thank you. Do you have thoughts about the appropriate standard? Yeah, you know, one of the things I uh, think gets overlooked sometimes with psychiatric emergencies or acute psychiatric illnesses, that these are uh, severe illnesses just like a heart attack or asthma attack or being in a car accident, and sometimes that gets overlooked, and that people are suffering, and too often we are delaying things so much uh, because... Um, you know, the, the, the people in the facilities are like, oh, it's just psych, you know. They can be put at the end of the line, um, and, and then that's not important. They'll be okay. We've got somebody coming in with chest pain that's more important. I've even had a colleague who told me, um, you know, I don't even really think any of this mental illness stuff is legitimate, you know, because there's no blood test or x-ray that shows mental illness. Therefore, it doesn't really exist. Uh, and, and so I thought about that once, and, and, and I thought, you know what else doesn't have an x-ray or a blood test to prove exists, but we all know exists, is pain. So I often think of, of a severe psychiatric symptoms as the equivalent of the worst headache you've ever had in your life. And that's what I try to teach doctors who work in emergency settings. Think of that, a worst headache you've ever had, because we've all had something like that. And if some, you came in and somebody said, back of the line, your, your symptoms aren't important, you don't need help right away, and you're like, oh my God, no, this headache, it hurts so much, I need help now, please help me. If you think of things that way, all of a sudden, you've got that clear and convincing concept that there's, there's a serious situation going on. And it's not that somebody's a bad person, they're a good person who has bad symptoms of a bad illness and they need our help right now. Just like you would never accuse somebody of not having chest pain or not having been in a car accident, you shouldn't be accusing people of, of like not having symptoms that are distressing from mental illness. And those can cause problems sometimes and they can cause problems that lead to uh, a police intervention or, or, or need for at least initially, uh, um, you know, involuntary in intervention. Sometimes the way I think of that is, you know, if you, let's say that you had been in a car accident and, and you were bleeding badly from your head and you were very confused and you were kind of wandering away from the car and the paramedics came up to you and said, come on, we got to get you to the hospital right away, you're bleeding from the head. And you said, no, 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 I'm fine, just leave me alone. I mean, they, they wouldn't leave you alone, right? They would say, you really need help. We're, we're going to get you the help. I think of that as being very similar to the initial part of involuntary detention. And it's the same thing because it's the severe symptoms that need our evaluation. Now, once you get beyond that point and, and then you have a few days of everything, then I think the standard changes. But at least initially, just getting people the help there is, 
It, it's the same thing. These are medical conditions, and, and people need our help right away. And if we look at them that way, then it's a no-brainer. You, you, you want to get people help, and let's do it right away, and then let's worry about those different levels a little bit down the road, if that makes sense. Cool. Brian, do you? Uh, yeah, just a, a couple things on um, when you think of danger to self, danger to others, and, and gravely disabled. The, the danger to self one is interesting because, um, you know, there's, it's not against the law to hurt yourself. It's not against the law. And, it, and it's, so it's just uh, one of those things that we look at. And as police officers, uh, a suicidal subject is a very, very dangerous situation for a police officer to be in, whether it's uh, somebody who wants to jump from a building or using a firearm or other instrumentality to do that. It's, it, it, so that makes me pause when I think of danger to self, because if we look at somebody calling a suicide hotline, I, I talked to folks from D.D. Hirsch, it took about 50,000 calls in a year. And I said, how many of those do you refer back to law enforcement response? 1%. Wow. So wait, what are, what, what's going on with the other people? They're not being, they're not put, we're not putting them on a 5150 hold? What's going on? Well, they're getting help some, some other way. And so when we say that, and some of the things that, uh, that I've started thinking through is, when you call 911, the only difference between calling 911 and calling D.D. Hirsch is what? Everybody knows 911. I, I couldn't tell you what a suicide hotline number is. Most people can't. And so one of the thoughts is if we had in our 911 call center to have somebody from a suicide prevention hotline there, and when you call 911 right now across the country, if you call 911 and say, I want to hurt myself, really tell me about that. What, do you have a plan? Well, I'm thinking about taking some pills. What do they do? Do they send you an ambulance? Anybody? They send a, pol a police car. Across the country, that's what we do. So you get, you know, uh, uh, Carla and I showing up to your house as police officers and we're dealing with a suicidal subject. And so one of the things is, what if we just said, I'm going to have you talk to somebody from, from a suicide prevention uh, hotline sitting right next to me? Because believe me, there's, um, I talk to all of our dispatchers and they don't feel comfortable transferring somebody who is suicidal to a line where they don't know. So anyway, there's just... so. The, I think the standard is good, but I think that on the danger to self, we, we, we put ourselves in a bind as police officers when we're called to respond and we're bringing the gun to a suicidal subject's house. And just makes, sometimes that just doesn't make sense. So try to rethink that a little bit. Um, so, okay. Um, why don't we open it up for questions? Rudy, Rudy Caceres again. Um, I want to um, applaud you because I, I feel like based on what you said that you come from a place of putting the person first and not working from a place of how do I get this person to see that they're ill, that they need to be hospitalized. And I'm interested in learning more about your methods. My question is about mandated reporting. And it's my understanding is that there, there's not mandated reporting laws in every single state and jurisdiction. It's usually more of the policy of the healthcare system and the individual hospitals. And from what I've seen, and I, I don't speak for everyone, is that when there's opportunities for people to speak openly about suicide, especially with their peers, and not have to worry about a power structure, not have to worry about um, getting the cops called on them, people are usually more willing to open up. I get that that's not everyone, but there's so many people that are missing out because they will never um, talk to someone that might call the cops on them. They're never gonna talk to a psychiatrist or a therapist with the risk of having the cops called on them and them being hospitalized. And you're missing out, because I hear this put as a brick wall so many times, this mandated reporting thing, that like, oh, you don't understand, I can go to jail, I can get sued. But I struggle to find data and statistics of how many times that actually happens where someone didn't report suicide and they were sued and or put into uh, jail. Yeah, that's a great question because I don't think that there's actually really per se mandatory reporting requirements, as it were. Uh, I think it's a, like like you you assumed it was a hospital to hospital thing. There there is uh, a lot of concern among providers that if they uh, hear you talk about things that uh, put you at risk, that uh, if they don't do something about it, that they are going to uh, the, the, the term I always hear them say is uh, putting my license on the line. 
And so maybe they're, they're reaching out um, because they feel like they need to cover their rear end, let's say. Um, I, 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 the the uh, information that the, uh, he just gave about the D.D. Hirsch, where he was saying only 1% of their suicide calls actually ended up getting reported, shows that it's not necessary. And getting somebody the help that they need is a better uh, approach than just punting and trying to get the authorities involved and thinking that that protects you. And in fact, that's probably not protecting you because you don't want to have uh, you know, the uh, authorities coming in. You know, it, it's such a, a sad thing that we even do have this situation where uh, for the crime of being suicidal that you have to do the perp walk and be handcuffed and put in the back of the squad car in most places in the United States. I mean, that's not getting help, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's got to be better ways for us to engage and, and, and not feel like, uh, oh, gee, somebody's suicidal, let's call the police or let's call EMS or call whoever we, we do. Uh, and so I'm completely in agreement with, with what you were just saying a moment ago. I don't know if you, uh, the judge has anything to add to that. We don't, we don't have a uh, mandated reporter system in New York. So if somebody was suicidal, probably either they would have done something to uh, get a family member to bring them in or have uh, the police or EMS, uh, if somebody is in the street wandering around, uh, we had a good part of this winter between 12 and 30 degrees and they were wandering around in a jacket or in shorts uh, without any food and they seemed lost, the police would bring them right to a hospital in all probability. So we don't necessarily have mandating, mandated reporting. And if it was something where the person threatened it at home, the parents would either bring them directly to the hospital with EMS or they take out a warrant if they didn't feel it was imminent. So we don't, we don't really have that problem so much. The question is if somebody does attempt the suicide. Uh, I had a case where, where it's probably the worst case that I've had so far where somebody needed 42 stitches because they tried to commit suicide by, well, I'm not gonna say because it's really gory, but I, I, I was shocked and that to me, to this day, that's, that's the most serious case. And that was probably one of the few cases where the entire family showed up in court to try to make sure that this person got into the hospital. So it, it's not something where the police just come in and, and take over, it's usually either someone is acting so erratically in the street that they think there's a problem, uh, somebody running across Broadway in the middle of traffic uh, or something to that effect, or it's something that the family members call in, or if they're living in a residence, sometimes older people are living in a, in a older residence and they're acting out in the residence and they're locking themselves in the house and they're not eating and there's no food in the refrigerator, they may call as well. But it, it's not something where it's mandated and they just come flying into the house and grab the person and, and take them in. It's not like with uh, child abuse or child neglect where a teacher would call it in or there's an obligation by anybody in the public to call something into the police. You know, if I could add a, a, a one more point while we're on this topic, and one of the things that's uh, you know, emerged in the most recent years, which I think is a real positive thing, is the... Uh, use in the crisis setting of what are called peer support specialists. And these are, uh, for those of you unfamiliar, peers would be recovering consumers. And in the crisis setting, they're often used in a role similar to um, a sponsor in AA, for example, where if somebody's calling up and they're suicidal or you're meeting them, it's like, hey, I've been here uh, just like you. I've been through this before. We're gonna get you through it. Things are gonna be okay. And getting that kind of help, and it's, it's good for the person who's in that crisis, but it's also good for the support specialist who's really getting something back and, and able to get trained. And I think there's um, training programs and, and even uh, certification now in all 50 states, so that's a really neat thing that's happening. Not except California, right. Yeah, for some reason. But I think it's around the corner, so keep your fingers crossed. Hi, my name's Ashley Nahai. I'm a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist. Um, and I work with a uh, substance abuse population, um, and I actually oversee a peer mentoring and, and case management program. Um, and 
I coordinate care for clients with their peer mentors, their therapists, their psychiatrists, their case managers, et cetera. Um, and what we unfortunately see more often than I would like is situations in which uh, clients go back into using drugs and alcohol, have mental health issues, and uh, are on their way to becoming either a danger to themselves or others or gravely disabled. They may not be quite there yet, but based on years of working with these clients and seeing where it's going, they're headed there fat, you know, pr pretty quickly. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the times when you know we we do get the authorities involved or whatnot, um, there isn't quite the criteria to hospitalize or or get them um, more vigorous treatment. Uh, and so, I, I guess my question for the police officers mostly is, how much do you take into consideration what you're seeing with the patient or the client, uh, what they're reporting? and then what family or therapists or case managers are reporting the behaviors and, and issues are? Um, from our perspective, um, it changed with 5150.05, which allows of the Welfare and Institutions Code, which says not only allows us, but mandates us to look at history mm -hmm. and to look at th credible third party information. That allows us now to, you know, somebody say, well, I'm, that's not, I'm not, uh, I'm not suicidal, or right, no, that's not me. Mom's going, no, this is, I, every time this happens, we're two steps away from danger to self, danger to others. And that then allows us to, um, to utilize that information. Now, I would love to say that, yes, every time, that's the case. It's not. Um, we have in the LAPD our SMART team, which is a system-wide mental assessment response team, which is an LMFT, or a licensed marriage and family therapist, or a psychologist, goes out with a specially trained police officer. But we only get to about 42% of the calls that we, that we could because there's just not enough. Um, and there's, it's a big city. I mean, average response time is six minutes. So I'd say, I'd love to say every police officer knows 5150.05, knows the criteria, knows to listen to that, look at the history, but it doesn't always happen that way. So that's kind of the, the answer I have. I'd like to add to that. Um, the section does say it has to be a credible informant. Granted, in this section, in this case, you know, we do take into consideration the family, friends, and whatnot, but, um, we can only do so much. It goes back to the application itself. Simply drug use and the possibility of this person exhibiting mental health behaviors because of the drug use, sometimes hospitals may either assess that, detox them, and then consider maybe possibly putting them in a hold. So it, it gets hard because at the same time, our application, we go, we do have a license, we have the same similar criteria that LAPD does, but when we don't have that section because of availability or because there are other cases or whatnot, in a day, I work the city of Bellflower. I can tell you we deal with 5150s, probably about a good 80% of our calls. And it's because of the meth, uh, stimulants, mm -hmm. heroin, whatnot. In this situation, we can only do so much. That application is filled out, it's turned in, we transport to the hospital, and sadly enough, within a couple of hours and the person is now detoxing, they get released. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary Palafox, and I represent uh, Schizophrenia and Related Disorders Alliance of America. And one, I have a son with severe schizophrenia, and it is a medical condition. And part of the problem that I wanted to have you guys address is that we have a bifurcated healthcare delivery system. You know, the patients are under mental behavioral health and their condition is a medical condition. Uh, my experience is that in calling for emergency help and care, if same patient, same county, same mental health laws, if he was in front of a doctor, 100% of the time he was um, advised of his need for treatment. 50% chance in front of a law enforcement because they have community safety in mind. And I'm in Orange County where we don't have a lot of the smart teams and the MET team and you guys have here. So the people that come out on our crisis team, 5% of the time he was admitted. Um, I want you to address the scope of practice people have and their level of education and expertise to understand that the medical symptoms are a symptom of an illness and allow to progress and advance 
you can have more brain damage and become treatment resistant. So that happened to my son because he was allowed, he was never sick enough for five to six years to be declared gravely disabled. Well, when he was, he was given back to me in a horrid condition, and now he's on conservatorship for this ninth year at 33. So I would love to have you address scope of practice, education and training, and how someone who doesn't have a medical degree can look at somebody in this field and be able to determine whether or not they need to be going to a hospital to be evaluated. Thank you. Well, I guess that's defaulting to me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and I'm very sorry for your story. It's heartbreaking to have to hear that. And, and, and uh, all good wishes to you for things to improve. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's a very difficult thing with the way that the system is set up. Uh, I think it was based on the idea that there needed to be a reasonable person making an assessment where they were hearing both from the medical community and then an alternate view from maybe the consumer, him or herself, and other people speaking out who had a different opinion, and, and that's that's kind of where things evolved. Uh, is that the, the best way for things to go? Um, I don't think we want a world where the doctors are able to make decisions uh, without any uh, fear of being, uh, uh, you know, having an opposite point of view. So I, I'm fine with, um, other people working and saying, we disagree with you, doctor, and we're not people with medical degrees, that's fine. It's, that means it's up to me or my colleagues to do a better job of, A, engaging, like I said in the first place when I was speaking earlier, to make sure that we don't even have to get to an involuntary point where we're actually engaging and we're working together and there's no need for forcing anybody to do anything. But if there is those rare cases, which I hope they're rare, that somebody needs to, I know they're not now, but hopefully that they will be at some point in the future, um, that it, I've, I've got to do a good job of really stating the case so that a reasonable person, a judge, a hearing officer is going to understand and, and then the, the other side can make their case and I don't think they need to have medical degrees. Um, and, you know, it's a free country and people need to be able to have their own advocacy and defense and, and we'll try to sort out what the best way is. But again, going back to my original point, best case scenario is we never have to get to that point. And I'm not doing a good job unless I'm engaging people and almost never have to go to involuntary detention and commitment. I don't think I've ever heard one of the doctors uh, on any of my cases refer to schizophrenia as a medical condition. I mean, uh, it's treated as a mental illness uh, and uh, dementia, which could be picked up on an MRI. I have a hard enough time getting them to try to do that in some cases where the person seems to me at least, this, especially if they're elderly, to possibly have dementia and they give me all the reasons why they don't need to do it and they need to take the drugs first. So. Most of the doctors in the hospitals that I deal with, and it's quite a number, don't really deal with schizophrenia as a medical condition. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I want to take a deep breath out <laughs> to engage my parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so I have a complicated question that I'm going to try to simplify. Um, it's involving the ER and medical malpractice, um, which no one has really talked about up here, um, involving misdiagnosis over medication and investigation of deaths occurring in mental hospitals. Um, some of these misdiagnoses include, um, there's multiple causes of misdiagnosis. For example, sch um, schizophrenia, psychotic features can actually be caused by childhood trauma which I'm not sure if everyone on here is aware of. Um, and and um, in addition to extensive sleep deprivation, which can cause psychosis. I'm not sure if they look into that when someone enters the ER, so I'm wondering what your opinion on that is. Um, and then in addition to the misdiagnosis, once the diagnosis is made in the ER, it's put into the chart. 
and the chart is carried out throughout the entire system. So if someone is diagnosed as having schizophrenia, they continue to have that diagnosis throughout their stay in the hospital um, when that diagnosis could be incorrect. In addition to that, Haldol, which you mentioned you're trying to get rid of, Haldol, Geodone, antipsychotic medications can actually cause psychosis. Um, so a person coming into the ER who's charted as having schizophrenia may in fact exhibit more psychotic features and be continued to label schizophrenic and be stuck in the system and possibly die. So I'm wondering what your opinion is about this as well as how do you prove this medical malpractice as well as surveillance within the hospital system for abuse? Okay, uh, you know, great questions, and uh, I think I can answer them uh, one by one. Um, your your question about schizophrenia in general and and the diagnoses of psychosis um, is exactly correct. In fact, uh, you know, one of the textbooks that I wrote uh, co-wrote called Emergency Psychiatry Principles and Practice. I wrote the chapter on psychosis, and ninety percent of the chapter was on medical conditions that can mimic the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia mm -hmm. and why we always need to be looking for that. I have something that I created called the six goals of emergency psychiatry. The first goal is to always establish medical stability and rule out medical causes for anything that appears to be a psychiatric condition. That's the most important thing we ever should do as psychiatrists or mental health professionals is not ascribe symptoms to what we'd want to be our, our last ditch diagnosis, our diagnosis of exclusion schizophrenia, because we wouldn't want to wish schizophrenia on our worst enemy. It's a horrible, horrible disease that, that, that um, is unfortunately at this point lifelong and, and is, can be very devastating to folks. Fortunately, we're able to mitigate a lot of the symptoms and, and do positive things with it, but it's still, it, it's, it's, a, it's a crippling disease. And I know this firsthand, the reason I even ended up going into psychiatry was when I was in high school, I felt very fortunate. I, my three best pals, which I thought were like, I, I thought I was so cool that they even wanted to hang around with me. One of them was the star of the track team, one of them was the lead in the school musical, and one of them was our valedictorian. By the time I graduated college, all three of them had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yeah, and right now, uh, one of them unfortunately passed away, one of them's in federal prison, and one of them is working as a stalker in a supermarket, which is still a fine job, mm -hmm. but he was our valedictorian at a pretty good high school. Oh, yeah. uh, and that's what schizophrenia does to people, and, and, and I don't want to see that happen to anybody. So anytime we see somebody come into the emergency department with acute psychosis, we're looking hoping to find any reason besides schizophrenia for the cause of these symptoms. So I agree with you explicitly that, and you don't make it off the cuff. You don't see somebody and go, oh, they're, they got schizophrenia. I've seen them for five minutes. No, it's, it's, a, it's a diagnosis of exclusion that you make over time by ruling many other things out first. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, if you're going to be looking at all the different things that you do with psychosis, you're, you're going to try to treat in uh, the least restrictive environment. So not try to hospitalize unless it's necessary and not try to force medications and, and use, if you do think medications are indicated, always use the lowest dose of the most benign medications possible and do that over time and see how they're done. Always in a safe situation with a lot of give and take between the, the, uh, the, the consumer and the provider. And, does that answer your questions? Um, kind of, but it's not really being done. So well, well, our, I apologize I mean, for that. I, unfortunately, we're going to actually have to stop. So people still online, feel free to approach us individually. And we're going to break box lunches, and then we're going to have a keynote address during lunch. So.